Hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn McGee, and I am thrilled to be here with um, an amazing author and very good friend, Amy Gillespie Doherty. She is the lead author of the Ancestors Within book series, Journals. And she is the host of the upcoming Ancestors Within podcast and Ancestral Summit, which is November 7th through 11th, 2022. She is passionate, passionate about changing the way you experience your ancestors. She's the creator of Irogenics, Ancestral Eye Reading, and the Ancestral Toolkit. She's setting a bolder, bolder okay. course for individuals and families to experience and explore where they come from and what they were born for. Ask her how to meet your ancestors today. So thank you, Amy, for being with me and for sharing your brilliance with this group. Um, just as a FYI for everybody who's watching, I did not understand my own ancestral connections. I skim coded it until I met Amy. And all of a sudden it was this connect the dots moment. So Amy, tell us your story of like, how did you understand or how did you get or how did you download all of that for those questions? You know, this, this connections with the ancestors and why it's so important. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure to share about ancestral connection, and it's always my joy to spend time with you no matter what. So, yay. Yes. So you're correct. You referenced a download, and in my daily meditation last January 6, 2021, which some of you may remember as being a sort of significant American moment with some trouble going on at the White House, on that day, I got a download that I was to write four books all about ancestral connection and to do a summit and a podcast in the with the mission of changing the way our world experiences their ancestors and specifically to work with those who have self-esteem challenges and those who are struggling with depression and some other things and the longer journey carolyn is i was i was adopted from birth and i didn't really know anything about my genetic family and as a child i was a runaway queen I'm sorry to say it to my lovely adopted family, but I was, I, I think I ran away like six times by the time I was seven. And I was like that little temper tantrum child. I want to meet my family. <laughs> Where do I come from? Why do I have two different colored eyes? Name it. I, I mean, I was all over them about it and they were so gracious. They're like, when you're old enough, when you're old enough, we'll, we'll help you. We'll help you find your, your genetic family. We'll help you. But right now you have to live here. <laughs> and, um, and so when I was 19, I met my birth mother for the first time. And the similarities were unreal. We had actually worked for the same company at the same age and even sat at the same desk at least once, even though it was three hours from where either one of us grew up. Now, I didn't meet my birth father until I was in my 50s, and he and I also had insane similarities, and not just he and I, but when I looked to my cousins who were all younger than me, they took the careers I was going to take, the colleges I was going to attend, the vocational things I was going to do. I mean, it was just absolutely unreal. But what I discovered, and the most important part is all those years I spent trying to figure out what's wrong with me, where do I come from? What am I supposed to do? I was really looking for myself. I wasn't looking for my genetic family. I was looking, as you said, the connect the dots. And so even people who aren't adopted, like yourself, find that when you start looking at your ancestral connection a little differently, a little more deep, all of a sudden you realize there's this rich wealth of assistance and explanation within us. And it can just make life so much more vibrant. Oh, yes, that is such a beautiful, beautiful way to describe all of that. And, you know, that's what you helped me uncover. You know, for those people who don't know this about me, I wrote a chapter in volume three of Amy's book, The Ancestors Within. Um, what is, yes, there we go. What is the subtitle on that one? This one is Recognize and Embrace the Gifts of Your Origins. So I have been a crazy gardener and I never really thought about it other than it truly brings me joy. It connects so deeply to my soul. 
and I have um, a spider plant that's heritage back to, I believe it's my great grandmother. And I have other, I know, right? So it's an indoor plant and we can see where it comes from. I, we've got one of those fake shamrocks. It's not like a sham, whatever. It, it's family, it's part of the thing. And that goes back at least to my grandmother, maybe older. Um, that's the Irish side. So the Scottish side, I have all these outdoor plants because my grandmother was a crazy gardener. And uh, around the time that I met Amy, I was getting ready to move. And I had dug up all my plants and put them in pots, knowing that I was going to be taking them with me. And it's not around the corner for me, by the way, people. It was from Massachusetts to North Carolina. Uh, and Amy's like, what an ancestral moment. <laughs> I'm like, right? Oh, 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 yeah, right, right. I never thought about the fact that my entire ancestry is, they're, they're farmers, they worked with the animals, they worked with the plants. And it was just such an opening up and a um, deeper level of understanding of who I am and where I came from. And yes, Noelle and Bob, I did give you a little piece of the spider plant. The spider plant for people who aren't familiar with it, it sends out little shoots that have babies on them. And then you root, you just cut them off and you, you put it in water and you root a new plant. So it's, I, I have shoots from this all over the world with friends and family that I have given to people. So Noel and Bob, I'm so thrilled that you, you guys still have my little baby that I gave you. And they're beautiful plants and they're so good for you. And it, it brings me joy you know, to, to carry that on and to send that out. So I'm just so grateful for you explaining that and helping me to see. And you've done that with how many authors now? We have 80 authors and artists in our, in our four books and two journals, and um, they've all shown up you know, some of them, I still couldn't tell you exactly how they found me or found the books. I mean, there was so much ancestral um, assistance in this because as you just caught, that's that's four books plus two journals that were all created inside of two years, inside of 700 days. And it's 101 chapters total. And they're just gorgeous to read. I mean, to just sit down and read them and look at all the different ways of experiencing ancestors and to think about having those discussions with your family, like on a weekly basis, yeah. it's just really, a, it's, it's really, I had no idea, no clue January 6th when I jumped in and they're, they're all still in the bestsellers. They're all still in the bestsellers on Amazon's a year later. Um, so they're doing very well with a lot of obviously ancestral support. Of course. And I think that's the most beautiful thing is, you know, understanding that, you know, it, we're not just us. I mean, of course we're us, we're all individuals. You know, we brought in our genetics for, for this go around. We bought in our soul's karma for this go around and the things that we're going to learn, but we really have all of the ancestors on both sides of our family that are there to support us. And what a gift. And you really taught me with your plant situation. So one thing that you'll hear me or read me saying over and over, if it's weird, bizarre, unique, if it went on up to age eight to 10, or if it's something that people would say only you, then it's ancestral. So, you know, here's Carolyn packing her plants into a U-Haul to get them to North Carolina. And she's like in tears. This is an emotional moment for her. She's going to take her plants. So chances are she has ancestors who brought plants over on the boats, right? I mean, no way around it. It's right. if it happened to her, it happened to them. But that was the first that I really realized, even for myself, that, you know, my husband and I have sort of this thing about trees. And I just recently was on a trip to Minnesota and I was stopping and seeing some family in Indiana and I actually packed a tree for them who packs a tree? <laughs> I was like, we got these two little trees. Don't you think your daughter needs a tree at her new house? <laughs> so I'm packing trees and carrying them cross country. I think you need a little tree. Um, and, and, you know, we just cannot, we're compulsive about it. Okay. We cannot turn down a cheap tree. You know, we actually go out and kind of harvest out of the forest little trees and bring them home and <laughs> nurture them to be big trees. And, and suddenly we had to look at our own ancestral moment with that, that somewhere our ancestors, and sure enough, in research, I found that I have ancestors in Belgium about four to 500 years ago who were taking care of plant orchards 
And that's our house. Peaches, plums, pears, persimmons, pecans, and pawpaws. We just brought home some pawpaws. <laughs> that's so beautiful. And you know that anyone who immigrated, like my um, my mother, my mother's family um, has been here since the 1600s. I mean, I can walk through, I know, right? So I can walk through a cemetery in Massachusetts where it's so ironic I ended up, not ironic, I, ancestral, that I ended up there when I never lived there before. I was in New York and I was just so drawn to go there. And that's where the farms were. You know that they brought seeds with them when they moved from England. It, there's just history books it, 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 it's everywhere that that's what people did they packed a minimal amount of clothing they brought more things like the seeds and how they were going to start the farm when they got to the new world and so for right. me doing that yeah it's I'm actually getting chills as I speak it's you know it's it's that it's the recreation, it's the allowing it to move forward. It's so powerful and seeing that and honoring it. I think so many times we do things unconsciously. Like we don't, like I knew that the plants were really important to me, but until you said that statement, yeah, it didn't integrate into my soul. So thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. And that truth, again, so I'm adopted. So much of what I've discovered is part of my genetic family. I didn't discover until I was 30, 40, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So just kind of logging, logging those little things in life along the way, you will find validation one day. So just as recently as, I guess it was about two and a half years ago that my husband and I bought this farm. And it's in kind of Northern Virginia, about 45 minutes from Chesapeake Bay. And it was, when you pull out the plot maps, we've discovered this after we bought it. Um, first off, there was an easement that ends at a, um, a swamp. <laughs> ends at a swamp. And I'm like, honey, that's a moat, okay? I, I, come from, <laughs> I come from Scottish and British and Irish. That's a moat. Well, anyway, long as we go, we start looking at the plot books. And this is, was a Huntley land track. Um, one of those British land tracks, you know, given by a nobleman or a king or whatever. And it was known as Huntley Land. Well, my ancestor's first castle in Scotland was Huntley Castle. So you, you, you know, you come by these bits of information. And even if, let's say, you've got an ancestor or let's say you have a grandparent who was a foundling where like the line is lost. We have no idea where this person came from. If it's weird, bizarre, unique, <laughs> it's, it's ancestral. You're repeating ancestral moments all day long, right? And and the weave, like in the adopted situation, I find that the weave between my genetic family and my adopted family are just unreal over and over and over again. And well, what's an example um, so it's of that that you can share? So um I was a I was a Gillespie, as you as you mentioned, I was a Gillespie. I was adopted by the Gillespies. That's my grandma my grandma's picture back there and my dad's baby shoes, his bronze baby shoes. And, um, but in 1170, I, you know, ran my DNA and did my genealogy. And in 1170, I'm related to the Gillespie's. So I was adopted by my own family 800 years later. Um, right. My birth mother's sister was in college getting her teaching degree. The same time my adopted mom was in college getting her teaching degree, same college. They probably had classes together, even though, again, it was not near where either one of them lived. Last week, my mom closed, my adopted mom closed on, on selling our family farm on Friday at four o'clock. Last Friday at four o'clock, my genetic father closed on his house, <laughs> purchasing it, which kind of came out of the blue. I, I, I mean, there was no mention that there was going to be a house transaction going on. And then all of a sudden he's like, I'm closing on Friday. I'm like... I know someone else who's closing on Friday at four, um, just over and over and over again. My friends just love to sit and listen to me tell stories over and over. Um, he, oh. my birth father worked with profiling fingerprints and software as I work with profiling eyes and software. And um, we didn't know any of this about each other. You know, I mean, when we first met, the synchronicities were so off the charts. You know, it's just, you know, we were sitting at our, our first meeting at a restaurant 
And he was like, give me fingerprints. And I was like, give me eyeballs. I was like, we're a couple of genetic freaks. Look at us. We both have something that we're just like so into that he's just like our down the rabbit hole. And, um, and like I said, you start getting into my cousins who didn't even know me and they followed career courses and, and schools and everything that were right in alignment with exactly what I was chasing after when I was their age and they didn't know anything about me. So it's been a really wonderful healing experience to kind of be able to take these times and just love on all the information we don't know. Right. So you mentioned right? all the we don't yeah. have. Right. So you mentioned the ancestral eye reading. Tell us a little bit more about how you, that came into being for you. You know, I had mentioned before that I had done the more traditional you know, iridology eye reading, mm -hmm. which is the emotions and some of the physical physical aspects. But to have you read my eyes and show me my ancestors, I have to admit, as open minded as I am, it freaked me out a little bit. So yes, it would. Yeah. <laughs> So tell people about that because it's fascinating and it's very unique. So um, I was in Africa doing survival skills training in um, the early 2000s. And when I came back, I wanted to continue working with kids. And I thought, well, what, what is the survival skill needed for American kids? And it was really regarding self-destructive behaviors and suicide patterns. So I took a course from a guy who had trained in iridology and he had this course on conscious language, how we speak what our subconscious believes, like I never win, right? Or I'm never going to get that job or, you know, whatever. Our, and if you think like you can choose to quit smoking or you can decide to quit smoking. Well, if you think about the word decide, there's homicide, suicide, genocide, pesticide, insecticide. If you decide you're killing one of the options, which in the case of quitting smoking isn't bad. But other places, you might want to use the word choose. Well, anyway, he had this conscious language course, and he was doing something called bioptic holography, looking at the eyes, the seven layers depth into the eyes, and looking at behavior patterns. So like I said, he was working in subconscious language, so he was looking at behavior patterns. So I took his training, and, and I thought, that is just the coolest thing I ever saw, right? And then I thought, something seems like it's missing. So I went and trained with the next guy who was working with personality patterns. And then I trained with the next guy who was working with whatever the next thing was, scleras or whatever. And then the next one. And then all the way along, I was like, now, wait a minute. If somebody has a marking in their eye for sibling rivalry and they're the oldest child, they don't have any siblings. So how does that work? Then every time they get a sibling, does their eye change? Does it change back? I was like, something here just doesn't add up. Well, then I finally got to someone who was working with grandparents and birth order. And I was like, that's it. This was our ancestors issue with sibling rivalry with girls or a female competitive environment, whether that be a bunch of nurses with a charge nurse, whether that be little ice skaters vying for the Olympics, whether it be girls cleaning rooms on the Titanic and who's got to clean the chamber pots, whatever it was, they had a female competitive environment. So in our world, it's going to come back as somebody nitpicking at us. How come Amy always gets this? How come Amy always gets that kind of thing? But along the way, as I was doing ancestral eye reading and developing it, I would see what looked like a baby, what looked like a military soldier, what looked like, you know, a child or a woman with a braid down her back. Well, then pretty soon I, I moved to Virginia to be here with my husband and um, my fiance at the time we got married here. And he said, Amy, you've got to share this with the world. Nobody knows this exists. And I was like, oh, honey, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, But along the way, people would say, don't you see that man in my eye? Don't you see that girl? Well, all that time, I'd been trying to stay very academic because when I was in Colorado, I was working with Department of Corrections, Boys and Girls Clubs, social workers. So I wasn't going to talk about ghosts in your eyes. But as I started working holistic bears and things here, I was like, you know, people have between 20 and 200 images in their eyes that they can clearly define and go, oh my gosh, there's someone who's wearing a jacket or a hat or or whatever. People who have lighter fiber, their images are lighter. But some people have images that are so clear, it's like you just pulled a photograph out of a scrapbook. And that's what you were talking about experiencing is, oh my gosh, there's my ancestors in my eyes. So the girls at Walgreens where I print my pictures, 
they say what I do is creepy cool. And it kind of is because all of a sudden you're seeing these people who were part of your lineage who are showing up. If they had challenges in escape, their images are in escape. If they had challenges with altruism, giving something that wasn't asked for, then there's markings in altruism. A gift for writing at six o'clock, all those authors of the past are down there, those storytellers who maybe didn't write books, but they were still great storytellers. And so um, it's really been just an amazing, amazing experience that got a little bit put on hold while I was doing the books the last couple of years, but next year I'll be creating an app where people can start reading their own eyes. That's so awesome. Now, I know we didn't talk about this before, but do you have an image that you could share with people and kind of explain it? I was just thinking about where I would have an image. I, can, I know I have one. You can screen share if you've got an easy one. You oh, say, I want to screen share? Yeah, if you yeah. want to do that, go right ahead. And uh... <clears throat> well, I'll start with this one. This one's one of my favorite. It looks like I have to do them one at a time, but that's probably good because then you don't see yeah. just how full my screen. Is. Okay, Carolyn, can you confirm? Can we see I, yes, this we gold? Can see this, and this is so worth it. You know, a picture really is worth a thousand words. So this is fabulous for everybody to be able to see this. So yeah, please tell everybody um, what you got here. Perfect. Okay. So if you're watching this on like a big screen, then probably this image is very big. And the thing is smaller is typically better because if we go big, we're going to pixelate. All of a sudden you start seeing the the fabric of the camera and all of that. So these are fabulous on a cell phone with those high resolution screens. But in here we have a woman with a white kind of blousey blouse um, and um, kind of not necessarily Renaissance, but the slim waist and skirt, her hair pulled back here. And can you see that Miss Carolyn? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Now I'm also so gonna so white so, part, so that's in the white part of the eye next to the iris, correct? Okay. It is. That's one of the places images can show up. They're what we call reflective images when they show up in the moisture or in like the sclera or even in the pupil. Now, while we look at this eye, we'll see up here this dark coloration, right? And let me pull in a magnifier. And again, I always think smaller is better because if you get too big, it's like taking a magnifying glass and getting too close to a black and white picture and you just get gray dots. But do you see the man's face here? Oh my gosh, yes. Let me pull it off. So there's here. I'm sure we're looking at a face over here. Let me see if I can get that. See him right here? <laughs> yes. And as you start looking, you'll see well, let's just keep going. The girl yeah, here. It is amazing, pulled back. It? Yeah. Oh, yeah. As you start, as you start diving in, all of a sudden you'll see one tiny mark in the eye. And if you really macro image it, all of a sudden you'll see others. So let me take you to a different screen. Let me see if I can do it this way. I guess I gotta do it this way. Stop share and then let me yeah, show there's a screen. Back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a smoother way to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and we'll grab this gentleman next. Okay. Do you see this blue eye? I do. Okay. So remember I said when people have light eyes, oftentimes you really have to kind of work to see the images in here. You may have to change your contrast a little bit because I can see the shadow here, but if I either take that exposure down a bit, um, or increase the contrast a bit, we'll come up with images. But do you see the man's face over here? Yes. And let me take him down a notch for you. Now, do you see him? Oh yeah. <laughs> Glasses, forehead, nose. So again, smaller is typically better because if we get too big, all of a sudden we lose the imagery. But now you notice here, there's this shadow on his nose. Yeah. to the left side. Now, if we increase that, what you'll see is here's a man hunched forward with a dark jacket, white pants and black shoes walking across this man. So That's here's his head. Great. It's like a silhouette. Yeah. yeah. Almost like so, a and from, uh, from the, you know, the Cold War, right? 
Right. And the thing is, so, and there's another face coming through here. And so what happens is, again, there's typically a bunch of images in here. So if something looks a little weird, there's probably another image there. There's seven layers in the eyes. And so every time you look at your eye photos, you're going to see different images. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? I, where did the baby go? Where did that doctor come from? It's like, and so in my world, what do I say all the time? Your ancestors have waited your whole life for this moment. Well, that's why I say it because it's true. They've waited for you to see them for the first time. I just took this one. I guess this was last week or the week before. Uh, you see the brown eye here? Yeah. Brown eye? Yep. Okay. Well, we call this lower area from four o'clock to eight o'clock. We call that the performer wedge. It's like everybody who thought they were the bomb during their life, they love to show up in this space. Like anybody who's in the red hat club, they're going to wind up in somebody's eyes down in this space with or without their red hat. So let me, let me see. Let's take it down a bit. You start to see images in here. So let me just grab, we'll see how we do with magnification. Yeah. Where do we start? Where do we stop? Someone here. Let me see if I can make these a bit bigger for you. Yeah, let me pull that over right here. Like a child with a maybe Renaissance era jacket walking this direction. Uh -huh. So some will be very small, some will be partial, and some, this is a great example, someone from behind, like a woman with her hair pulled back in a ponytail walking yeah. away from us. When we see that, it means there are people missing in our ancestral line. Somebody could come from 23andMe or um, Ancestry.com and say we're related on our DNA test, but I can't find it. And they're not going to. Either the record building is gone or somebody's father isn't who we think it is, or somebody ran away from home and changed their identity back in the days when you could do that. And so, I mean, I always wish when I do this that I'd paid more attention in history class yeah right i'm when like that, when a change happens amy does do the eyes change if you can connect the dots or do, do like that woman walking away that that's unrecognized mm -hmm. or perhaps a missing link if you find a way to connect that link does it do your eyes shift change. so it's a great question so pretty much everything in the eyes was here when we were three days old the people who have the, the freckles and brown spots, like we saw with the Scottish woman eye, that, that shows up between age two and age 22. But for the most part, what's in here when we're born is here our whole lives. So I kind of consider it like scripture. Like every time you read the Bible, you might pick up a new nuance out of a section, but the words haven't changed. They've always been there. They just right. mean something different. So in my experience, they don't change. In my experience, they stay the same, but you may see different things, different layers, different levels kind of thing. Um, but it's a brilliant question. And when I first started, you know, I started right there, right? I was like, I was like, oh my gosh. So I'm going to take people's eye pictures and then they'll go to the spa and have a treatment. And then their eyes are going to be like all fixed. They're going to be all healed. <laughs> well, I was young, you know, young and naive, but, but the thing is even iridology has been <laughs> well, that's what iridologists thought for many, many years. They thought that the eyes changed instantly. But what they found is that with the higher resolution cameras of today, they realized that most of the aspects of the eyes are there permanently. Um, just a very few things change, like I said, from age two to 22. And once our brain finalizes by age 25, they're pretty much done um, unless there's an anomaly, an accident or a condition. Now, eye color can appear different. Some people can appear to have gold eyes at one time or gray at another because that's a reflection. It's a projected color. So when you actually take the pictures, you know, I take pictures of people's eyes that are so dark, they're black, but they may show up kind of goldish or light brown because I put a lot of light on them. So you get to see the real colors. People with green eyes almost never have any green in there. They're blues and grays and golds and things that reflect out as green, but the actual color of the eye is not. So, um, so no, we don't really get to see um, changes when we heal things. But you know what? It's really a connection point, right? It's a connection to meet that woman who was unknown. So when she becomes known, we may see another image of her in our eyes that we didn't realize was her. 
right? But yes. the part of her that was unknown at whatever facet, you know, sometimes you'll see images of children. That doesn't mean that the child we see at four o'clock is not the adult we're looking at at 11 o'clock. And we're just looking at a different vignette out of their life, a different movie trailer. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It's a pretty it wild really experience. Wild. It is really wild. So how long have you been doing the, your unique version of eye reading? Let's see. I got back to the States in 2010. So probably about 2012 and 13 is when I was really starting to do the work through my nonprofit, Clara, named after my grandma in the picture, Clara. <laughs> Children's lives are the responsibility of all. And... Um, but really doing the shows and everything was just in 2018 when, when, you know, I was like, are you kidding? You really want me to tell people that their ancestors, like they have ghosts in their eyes. I'm like, really, God, this is what we're going to talk about. I mean, you know, but I was like, okay. And then once I got started on it, it was just, um, it was just insane. I mean, it just, it was everywhere. It was like, so the expansion is necessary. I taught a few people just before COVID started how to do ancestral eye reading, got the trademark, did all those parts. But next year, um, I'll be working more on, on broad scale, getting the training out there and getting an app up so people can start looking at their own eyes and kind of making their own connections with their ancestors. That's really cool. So I want to bring in a few of the comments here. Kate said, wow, that you can see things in the eyes and that astounds her. And uh, Bonnie, I've taken courses in Reiki crystals, shamanic practice, and people say I'm a natural. My grandmother was born out of wedlock and is half native. I'd like to know if my abilities come from her. Now, is that something that you would be able to help somebody answer if you did an eye reading? Like when you get the app out and somebody could submit their eyes and you could do that reading, would you be able to actually answer that question for Bonnie? Yeah, so we would see the born out of wedlock at about 1145 in her right eye. And we would see um, also some of the half native things up there at about 12 o'clock right and left eyes. And the abilities, um, we would see, especially at like four o'clock, a direct run in with the church and cultural ideals of the time and the shamanic healing in the in the left eyes as well. So yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. And and her image will be in there. I mean, when we know who she is exactly, we may not, you know, but one day you'll get that message while you're looking at the eyes. And that's what I really try to do the most, like when I'm doing ancestral eye reading videos is to point out as many images to people because people aren't used to looking for them. And I've been looking at them for years, right? So once you start looking for your images, to use those as a connection point, to use them as a meditation tool, to say, who are you? Where do you fit in my life? Who can support me? Or, or where did this trauma come from? What is the part of this that needs to be healed? And that was really the first book in the series was Reveal and Heal the Ancient Memories You Carry. So things like challenges with identity or with a wedlock, out of wedlock babies, those kinds of things. So what I find is people, usually what we see in the eyes is between two and four generations back, between grandparents and grandparents' grandparents. And so if we find an adoption in there, we're gonna find it every two to four or three to five generations going back for hundreds of years. Now, so what may happen in your life is it's not likely to have to give a child up for adoption in 2022. Just doesn't happen that often. Not like it did in 1955, right? Or 1970, right? And so what'll happen is you may have to rehome your beloved pet, right? You may have to give up your beloved cat or your beloved dog because you're moving somewhere and you can't take them with. And again, the dynamics of what happens to you will match your ancestors. If your pet's too old to move, maybe when your ancestors were leaving Europe, they had a mother or father who was too old and frail to make the trip to America, and they had to leave them behind. The situation will repeat as if, and that's kind of what the eyes are. They're this map of these experiences that are on their way that for you, they're going to hit a special trigger because they were a challenge and a trauma for your ancestors. So we laugh and joke about Alice Island and oh our name they put down the name of the city instead of the name of my cousins ha 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 and we you know we think this is whatever and and we don't give it a lot of of love and compassion but that meant they were never going to see their loved ones again imagine their horror when their name was messed up 
And all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, no one's going to know who I am. They're not going to be able to find me. And we actually had an author in the book you were in, in the third book, who her name was spelled wrong on the cover. And, it, and she wrote me and she's like, oh my gosh, people aren't going to be able to find me. They're not going to know it's my book. And I was like, oh. That is so oh. Ellis Island. <laughs> I was like, that is so ancestral. And so once you start being able to see these scenarios, anybody who's going off about anything, they're in an ancestral repeat trauma. And it gives us an opportunity to have a ton of compassion for people. So I think you, Carolyn, have heard my example of um, people who went crazy about no toilet paper during COVID. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know those people who are going nuts over the toilet paper thing, right? And we're all kind of going, what's their deal? What's with the toilet paper? But they may have had an ancestor who during World War II couldn't buy stockings and therefore they couldn't get a job because if you didn't have stockings, you couldn't get an interview. And maybe they just saw some rich person buy all the stockings in the store who was never going to use them. Now they can't get an interview. They can't get a job. Their child gets sick their child winds up in a wheelchair or dies because they couldn't get stockings. Somewhere along the line, the family line is lost. Somebody's a foundling, somebody's given up for adoption. Nobody knows this story, but little Joe Schmo goes to Walmart and there's no toilet paper and he goes off. Who took the toilet paper? They didn't even need it. I need that. You're hearing an ancestral pattern repeating. And so it really gives us an opportunity for a ton of compassion for people, especially when somebody's going off about something that we're tempted to laugh at. To go. Right. Do you think it's also the other side, like the people who felt that you know they needed six packages of toilet paper? Right. Like what's yep. the story that you know that's a, got to be ancestral also that there's never enough because yeah. nobody needs that much toilet paper. Yep. And I could have bought it and I didn't buy it at the time and then it was gone. Right, right, whatever it was, coffee, um, meat, whatever, again, war rations. And we're not talking just World War II, World War I. Go back, go back, go back, 1700s, 1600s, 1500s. Who didn't get potatoes before the Irish potato famine, right? Oh my gosh, why didn't we get those when we could have? Well, we can get them, we gotta get them. We gotta take it all home. We gotta have this stuff. Yeah. Yes. So any place that there's some place that you, you know, I tell people, if you can't figure out your own ancestral stuff, just start looking at your friends and your neighbors and whoever you're making fun of. And you're like, oh yeah, I see it in them. That was ancestral. Well, it won't take you too long till you can figure out your own. Oh, that's so fascinating. So tell us um, about each book and, you know, the themes on them. Okay. Love so again, they came, in, they came in my morning meditation as a download that I was to make a series of books about engaging our ancestors, discovering our ancestors, connecting with our ancestors, embracing. And so our first was reveal and heal the ancient memories that you carry. And it's 25 chapters. And each chapter has a story from each author. There's 25 authors and 25 tools where you can actually go in and start working on um, resolving old ancestral traumas that have been hovering around in your life. So that was our first book. It's all about ancestral patterns and, and making them better and recognizing them and having that awareness that allows you to move past them and move through them. So that was our first book. Now, also in our first book, I will tell you, we have, um, we have an author, I mean, we have such a vibrant group of authors, but we do have an author in this book, um, Noah Smith, who is autistic and he's nonverbal autistic. And so he works with facilitated communication where his mom balances his hand as he types on a QWERTY board. And he has a chapter in here about autism and ancestors, and they do use it for autism awareness and for facilitated communication. And during this time, he connected with one of our authors and was able to start communicating telepathically. And so he now does healing work, um, especially over like Indiana, Ohio, but he also does mm -hmm. online, et cetera. And he'd been doing that work forever, but people just didn't know because he's silent, right? He's silent autistic. Now his sister, Adriana wrote in our second book, 
So our second book is Discover and Connect with Your Ancient Origins. And so this is all about different ways of connecting with your ancestors and finding them. So the first book I wrote about adoption, the adoption experience. Second book, I wrote about ancestral eye reading. But in the second book, Noah's sister, Adriana, who is also autistic, joined us. And she talked very much about the situation of autism and not being able to control their bodies and where their energy really is, where sometimes they're maybe out in the universe and how they got into an autistic body to start with. And, and I was so excited when she said yes, because I knew she was she was like that scientific master locked inside of autism. Um, and so I was so thrilled. And she actually, I asked her, I said, well, what color is the second book going to be? And she was like red. And I was like, oh, I don't think so. But <laughs> Adriana wins. So Adriana did win this. Now, just to divert for a second, those two books are in the first Ancestors Within Journal. Now the journal series, so the authors from books one and two, so re revealing and healing ancestral patterns and discovering and connecting with ancestors, each author provided a tool. Well, here we have 52 weeks of prompts for you to work on discovering and connecting with your ancestors and revealing and healing ancestral patterns. And the journals are designed for a family to sit down and go through the prompt each week ask the question, and then everybody kind of explore their answer, whether they're five years old or 50 years old, and then journal the favorite experience or just kind of the situation of the whole family doing it. And, you know, you could not finish this journal as a family and come out the same on the other side. I mean, you will develop such resilience and connection and compassion for each other, doing 52 weeks of connecting with your ancestors. Mm -hmm. And the children might color something, or maybe they'll plant a tree. One of our chapters was planting a family tree, collecting the soil from your ancestors' land, and then planting a tree in it. And I mean, there's just no way around the strength that your family will achieve if you actually do 52 weeks of ancestral connection. And starting in January, I'm going to be doing those live stream on the Ancestors Within Community on Facebook. So book three is yours, Carolyn. Did I see a question coming? Um, what I wanted to say is make sure you put the link for that group in the chat so people can join. They can join. When yeah, it's a free group. Yeah, it's a free group. It's, uh, there's all the other authors, a, a lot of the other authors post their things in there and you can ask questions so you can yeah, really get, yeah you can really understand and get answers for your questions on what's going on with your own ancestors or a particular tool it's a great group yeah it is so bonnie joseph you would find some people would answer your questions about your grandmother you know and mm -hmm. we've got everything from mediums to autistic authors to um, those who specialize in genealogy and DNA. I mean, there's just a little bit of everybody. So book three, recognize and embrace the gifts of your origins. This is one of my favorites. It's, um, it's all about the gifts and it's all about recognizing gifts and how to rediscover the gifts of your ancestors. And so, so many times when I'm doing ancestral eye reading, I find people who've turned away from an artistic or a healing ability in their early years, or particularly an intuitive or psychic ability, an ability to work with pets, that kind of thing in their early years in favor of something more practical. And this is a really great way to come back and recognize <laughs> and embrace the real gifts of your origins. And one of our authors in here was um, Don Dodson, who taught us how to take leather and create our own book cover. So like when someone in the family has died and they've got like an old leather coat or a purse that we're like, oh, what are we going to do with this? Um, how you can take that leather and turn it into a journal cover or a book cover. And he actually tooled with leather, the second Ancestors Within Journal. I'll come to that in just a second. So before so you go on to the net, to the fourth one, I have to tell you this story. Yes. You're going to love that. Hold one sec. So my son um, has w one of the spider plants. My son's 26 and uh -huh. not really into the whole planting thing, but falls in love with a woman who is crazy plant person, just like his mother, of course, right? 
So <laughs> we get together and his girlfriend and I are like this plant that and this plant that and you know all this <laughs> stuff. And now he's really starting to get into it. So it's just beautiful how the ancestors pulled together, continuing mm-hmm. the lit, continuing the energy through this other person who has the same love. It's it's just yeah. I, it makes me smile every time I think about it. And the thing is, if you could dig into the research, you would probably find where your family lines crossed 400 years back. I mean, I find it all the time, not just, not just genetically, but maybe someone who saved somebody's life in a war or somebody who took in a child and gave them an education. And now their great, 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 great grandchild, because we carry 11 generations with our DNA. We carry 11 generations within us. Yeah. So these lost intentions, these pledges these promises they're living on in us whether we're aware of them or not so probably better to get aware of them yes <laughs> so you absolutely. know exactly. <laughs> so book four is celebrate and honor your sacred origins and you can guess this one is all about ceremony and ways of recognizing not just ancestors um who live on within us, but like ancestors of place, like how we wound up buying this farm that came from my family's land anyway. Um, and also a couple of people did some fabulous things about um, ancestral dinners, the kinds of things you just don't think, you know how everybody says, okay, now get in there and ask your parents this and that, but what was grandma's favorite color? What was grandma's favorite dessert? What did you guys typically have on Easter? We don't think to ask those questions until the days are gone and we don't get the opportunity to jump in. And a special story talking about gifts. This artwork came from our artist, Melanie Ware in Australia. And she took no art classes in her life. And when she was in her 30s, she was a single mom and she was coloring mandalas with her daughter. And all of a sudden, this complete ability to channel, to astral travel, to go out and get universal information just opened up and they're actually considering her for a, um, a Netflix movie. Now. Um, I think she's in the second round of interviews for it. Um, and now she's done at least two Oracle decks with her artwork and she's, you know, world renowned with her artwork now. And that's the kind of thing that can happen when you start opening those ancestral doors, all of a sudden you plug into their ability and something activates, right? And that's really what this is all about. It's about having interactive experiences with your ancestors because you can and getting answers. We had one author in the fourth book who wrote about writing love letters to your ancestors. Like when you're missing information and you want to know more about how to write them a love letter and how all of a sudden within days, weeks, or months, information will show up that's been missing forever. So our second journal, The Ancestors Within Two, Again, a 52-week activity guide designed for the family to sit down every week and do the prompts and do the journal experiences and then journal about it. So you could do a journal a year or you could just do one. I mean, for a family to sit down on Christmas, right? Like, you know, as you start to like, you have couples in your family and everybody goes out and does the journaling thing on their own. And at Christmas each year, they come with like four or five of their favorite experiences from the year. I mean, it's so great because it's like, here's Carolyn reaching out to her ancestors and then she hands it down to her grandchildren. And now they're already going back at least five generations to interactive experiences. I mean, it's just near and dear to my heart. (laughs) And again, every one of them has been or still is on the Amazon bestseller. Um, The first journal, I didn't get it into Amazon on time. And so it didn't, It didn't make it into Amazon bestseller, but it did win the international cover award with 10,000 people voting. um, And it won gold award as anthologies and as a journal. So again, that's ancestors. That's not me. That's, I mean, that's a culmination of 80 people coming together from around the globe to embrace our ancestors and this mission to change how we look at our ancestral experiences and get that healing done. (laughs) Yeah. Right. On with our lives, open up those gifts that we should have opened up already and really get on top of who we were born to become, right? And because our ancestors are back there cheering us on, you know, they're back there. When we do something great, 
you publish your book, you open your inspired living. They're like, yes, right? And then when we have that day when we just fall down at Walmart and we're like, toilet paper. They're like, oh, that was me, 1658. Oh, I'm we so were getting sorry for that. Yeah. yeah. Right. And doing the healing is to let go of that. And, you know, Bonnie, Kate, Bob, if um, I know you're probably driving the thing, but if you've got any comments, questions, observations, type them in the chat so that um, yeah. Amy and I can respond to them for you. And yeah, it's like it just uh, until you understand if one of my um, one of my aunts, she's actually my mom's twin and um my mom and her sister, her twin sister are so different. They're fraternal twins. So, you know, they're genetically different, but yeah, they're right. also emotionally very different. And um, and my mom was always the carefree party, you know, let's, I mean, she lived in Europe. I was born in Europe. They were, you know, they, 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 Traveling, fun. I mean, there was a lot of other serious stuff, but that was her energy. You know, that's what she was. My aunt was the, the stay at home, take care of everyone. And she started the whole genealogy thing. I actually have a beautiful binder that she put together one Christmas for all of us. Each mm. grandchild got a binder that has all of the, you know, lineage on both sides. And it's mm. just, oh, what, I know what a gift, right? And I can go back yeah. and I can see you, know, okay, this, you know, we, we've got the other side of the fence thing going on. We've got the horse thief going on. Yeah, we got all these stories that, yeah. you know, we put them out there, but it's, itch, but mm -hmm. I can see, the parallels between what happened and now that I know, thank you, Amy, <laughs> that, I, you know, the things that happened in the past with what's going on now, I have a reference guide to go be able to go back and see, not through my eyes, um, yeah. but, you know, through history and what's documented, what's the energy that's driving certain things that are still showing up for me and my kids. Right, right. And to resolve them so you don't keep feeding them and passing them down the line. It's to heal really it in all directions, too. Yeah. You know, that's the power. Yeah. And you must have seen that so many times in the books and in your own experiences that when you heal this moment as a person, when you heal, you know, you heal mm -hmm. going forward into all the generations um, to come and you heal the people who have passed already. You just help move yeah. their evolution. Talk about that a little bit. I think that's well worth a discussion. <laughs> I agree. And Kate Roberts kind of asked about that. She said, so the healing happens just with the awareness. So I'm going to give you an example and then, then I'll circle back around. So you know those people who are like, you never listen to me. And they're enraged, right? They, they could kill you. They're so mad. You're not listening. And then you have those people who are like, they never listen to me. Like, they never listen. And, you know, they're in tears. And then you have the people like, ah, they never listen to me anyway. I'm just going to send them a text. So <laughs> the person who's, they never listen to me anyway, I'm just going to send a text. That's the ancestral pattern that's healed. The one that's outward is someone who's angry with others. And the other is someone who feels victimized, right? So the awareness, Kate, you're absolutely right. It's 99% of it. Just being able to stop in that moment and say, okay, we're, we're having an ancestral moment here. Somebody who listens to everybody is not listening to me. You know, in school, remember that time when you raise your hand and you answer the teacher's question and the teacher doesn't hear you and they're asking around the room, somebody else, even though you just answered it. And all the kids are looking at you and looking at the teacher like, that's someone who has an ancestral pattern with not being heard. Now, again, in our ancestors' time, that may have been they're calling the people to get on the ship to America and someone's yelling, I'm here, I'm here, and they're not being heard. It could be someone in a war who yells to his friend, look out. They don't hear him and they get blown up by a grenade. So that pattern of not being listened to was a huge trauma. Otherwise, it would not push your buttons. So whatever it was, the dynamics will match, right? Are you not being listened to by somebody who never listens to you? And you really should have probably stopped trying to convince this person a long time ago, yes. right? You should have just put it up. 
<laughs> Watch for the dynamics of how did you get in this situation again? Because that's where the answer is. That's where the healing happens. But it becomes don't engage the beast. Now, this doesn't mean you're not going to have emotions. When you're sad, you're sad. When you're mad, you're mad, right? And I mean, I'll be honest, I just went through this a week or so ago with my mom refusing to go to the hospital. And I mean, we were going around and around. And I'm like, oh, this is so ancestral. And in the moment, I'm like, oh, I don't know which of you this happened to or what year, but in your time, it must have been horrible. I've got 911. Okay. I've got a cell phone. You must have felt so alone in 1659 or in 1783 or whenever this happened to you. And just put a ton of love on those ancestors before you. And so, like in our case, I mean, we were at this for like three days, right? And finally, I mean, she just was not going to go to the hospital until finally she was having trouble breathing. And I was like, you have got to go to the hospital, mom. And I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning the newspaper with the headline, woman who writes best-selling series on ancestral healing leaves mother to die at 65 pounds while she gets on a plane, right? I like, we're not doing this. We are not doing this we not are going to continue the pattern. pattern right <laughs> we are not continuing this pattern and you know my mom is saying if you call the ambulance i will never forgive you and i know that i'm gonna have to take that chance if i can't talk her into it if i can't get her there i'm gonna have to take the chance on the other pattern right <laughs> it's gonna be one or the other and finally you know i just said mom you know you're putting me in a terrible terrible position i'm like we can I call the ambulance? And finally she nodded her head, yes. And um, we were fortunate. The doctors did not think she'd make it through the night. They told me if I got on that plane, I'd been turned right around to come back to a funeral. They said, there's just absolutely no way she would have survived the next 12 hours. But we had a chance to step into that healing moment and look at it for what it was. Not only a, a strong mother-daughter building moment, but a matter of we've got to heal this pattern. We cannot do this again. Somebody else is going to go through this if we don't fix it. And, and like I said, I had to wait. I was like, it's either this one, I'll never forgive you. Or it's this one of, oh my God, thank goodness. We, you know, got you out of there, got you into the hospital, whatever the case is. So, you know, when you do ancestral work, things are just going to get right in your face. The biggest family patterns, you know, I mean, you know, people who've been accused of being witch and pagan. Oh, let me tell you the things people are going to come up with for you. But what I found is this, if you don't engage the beast in the moment. So let's say the pattern is not being listened to and somebody who never listens to you and you guys get in this match every time you never listen to me. Why can't you hear me? If you can just go silent for 24 hours, not engage it, let it go, go, oh my gosh, this is ancestral. That's the new thought, right? The new thought is, mm -hmm. oh, this is ancestral. I don't know who this was, but this must have been awful for you. I am just going to let this go for now. I just don't have time to engage this. I'm going to let it go till tomorrow. All of a sudden, the person will call you the next morning and they'll be like, gosh, you know, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't mean to be so rude. Please, please forgive me. I meant to do this, this, and this. That's healing the pattern. So your awareness and your ability to evaluate, is this really a threat right now? Or am I responding to a threat in my family line for many generations? Am I over responding? Right? So when it came to the books, my publisher, Laura DeFranco and I were going around and around about titles and we were texting back and forth. And I was at this point, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even want to tell her my next idea because she isn't going to like it. And I was like, oh, Amy. 3.30 left eye. No matter what I do, it's not good enough for that woman. And I had to swallow right then and there, Kate, and go, this is mine. I'm the one going off, not her. <laughs> so what do I have? How, what do I have that's available to me to change the trajectory of this right now? And the answer is I can text. Laura, can we just let this go until tomorrow? I just feel like we're, we're overworking it. Sure. Four letter word. Sure done. She, she had no idea I had created this entire trauma about this book title thing. She had no clue. And this is how it works. We're triggering because it's our trigger. It's not necessarily the other person. The other person is helping us out by they're saying, showing up just to, yeah, they're, they're, showing, showing up. <laughs> they're showing up to give you that mirror of what you need to work on. <laughs> yes. 
say, is this one healed yet? Guess not. <laughs> right. Oops. And that's the go around. around. <laughs> And that's it. If it's hitting your buttons, you're like, Ooh, I thought this one was done, but I guess it's not healed yet. And that's about us. It's the ancestors within. They're inside of us. They're in our traumas. They're in our flare-ups. They're in our moments. And that's the title of the series, The Ancestors Within, because every bit of what we want to know is inside of us. And we can create interactive experiences with our ancestors where we can get answers, whether we know who they are or not. We know we have a grandmother. We know our father had a mother. We know our mother had a father. Even if we're adopted, we know those things. And so we can tap in and draw from that information. And, and it's a really, it's a game changer, I, I would say. I think Carolyn would agree. It's kind of a game changer. It is totally a game changer. Yes, absolutely. And even the, I have only done um, a mini reading with Amy. I have not had the pleasure of doing a full in, you know, in depth one, but that opened my mind to so many possibilities and just linked things of, oh, I didn't get that. And you, it, it, I'm highly intuitive. So, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I look back and I'm like, oh, I should have got that. But nobody offered it to me. So have Amy, um, having Amy give me those dots, really just yeah. it's so much easier. It's so much easier. So oh, and this you, you gave her the link. Good. And I'm going to put in um, the Facebook group for anybody that's interested. Good. That's the, um, yeah. Thank you. Good. good. I'm glad that you put that in. But it really made, it, it's like, one of my family ancestral um, energies, both sides, moms and dads, dum double whammy here is life mm -hmm. is difficult. Now, if you think about it, you know, they, they emigrated from, from Ireland in the potato famine, but life is difficult. You know, they came over in 1600 from, from England. Difficult. Life is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. There's right. a reason that it's coming down to me. But I get to change that for everybody and having that just insight of where it's showing up. Oh, such a gift. And really, if you think about it, you have, we're in 2022. We have escape rooms for those who have patterns with escape. Yeah. We have Gmail where we can get our email back within like five seconds for those who had issues with signing something they wish they hadn't. Right. I mean, I mean, you can see these people who have created these amazing things to beat ancestral issues without realizing ever that they were working with ancestral issues. And so, Kate, yes, we absolutely draw on their strengths. Absolutely. And so this is the thing about eugenics is, you know, it's been my work over the last, let's say, 10 years. But it's something that the development of that map will continue for many generations beyond me. Because if there's a gift for writing in six o'clock in the eyes, left eye for creative or channeled spiritual writing, and in the right eye for technical business, self-help curriculum, that kind of thing, then every gift is in there. But it takes people really knowing their stuff to pull that database together. So the development of the map will continue for many years. But as Carolyn said, even with 10 minutes of just taking a look at your life and, and reevaluating some of the things that have happened can change everything. And this is where, you know, I really need my work to get back to working with kids because kids will self-blame. It's my fault. I'm the common denominator. This always happens to me. You never listen to me. People have been killed over this. People have absolutely been killed over somebody not listening to them. People have committed suicide over not being listened to. And if they could just understand that this is an ancestral pattern and reevaluate the response to it, then that's the whole game changer. That's where this work needs to go and, and where it is going. We just kind of got this drop in of, hey, how about six books in a summit? You can do that, can't you? <laughs> like, sure. The books are easy. I was like, okay, I can do books. Then I was like, summit. Wow. Sure. I can figure that out as we go. Yeah. So perfect segue. Tell us about the summit. It's free. It's online. It's virtual. So it is 
Um, I'll tell you, I'll quote our author, Melissa Jolly Graves, who said, Amy, that's not a summit. That's an experience. And she's right. It's a hundred and it's over a hundred podcasts of each of our authors talking about different aspects of ancestral connection. There's five theme days. They match the four books. And then the fifth day is how to be a good ancestor of the future. It's, there's going to be opt-ins that are free. There's going to be free handouts, meditations, visualizations. There's way more information than anyone could ever get through in five days. It's, um, it's really phenomenal. Now, beyond that, um, there's an option to purchase an extended version for like $9.99, where you can have access for six months to all the panels and live streams and, and all the materials. And then there is a VIP package, which has the six month um, access to the summit. And then also my ancestral toolkit, which is a 58 page guide with, I think there's seven videos in there that are how to create interactive experiences with your ancestors. So you get in there and you get to like experiment with these and it gives you PDF journal pages. So you can make like a three ring binder. If you like dream journaling better, you can do that. If you like art journaling, you can do that. If you want to do nature-based experiences or sensory experiences. So it kind of walks you through all the ways of how to do these different interactive experiences with um, with your ancestors and to kind of move forward from there. So it's November 7th to 11th. Um, registration is open right now. And I'll put, yep, I can put a link in here. Yes. Um, and, and you can sign up for free. And then you can decide later if you're like, I really want to have more time because I want to get some Christmas shopping done, like with the books or the journals or some of the other great things that are being offered by our authors. It's really kind of kind of exciting. It is very exciting. And I think that that is incredible. 101 interviews. Now, how, and you said there's 80. Yeah, I know. And you interviewed them all. So that's 101 interviews that Amy Gillespie Doherty has done. <laughs> and I know you love to talk to people, but uh, that is a lot of giving, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it was really an amazing experience. It was one of the greatest gifts of doing the books. I wish I could have done the podcast first because to talk to each author and really dive into their experience of what they wrote about in their chapters, as well as um, to get in there and learn about even more tools and their stories was just a beautiful gift. And so the podcasts are really, they're really special. Um, and the videos that were done and um, so, for example, with Noah and Adriana, we did we did a podcast with the facilitated communication. But next week, we're actually going to do another one with telepathy that will also be on the on the summit. And um, yeah, it was just a brilliant experience. It, it was just so wonderful. And so, like I said, starting in January, I'm going to actually go through the two journals, which will take me two years. <laughs> but doing a live stream each week of each of the journal prompts and different ways to do these with those who are adopted or with those who maybe have a foundling in the family and there's a lost line, like we don't know where this side of the family came from or what they're about. Um, and yeah, that kind of whole linkage thing. So it's exciting. I'm really, we're talking about doing a live summit next spring where we do actual all nature-based activities. We haven't quite pinned down the details yet, but <laughs> yeah, I know. The good news is if you're in that six month extension, we'll have it all figured out by the time we get to April next year, we'll have it all put together. But I, there's so many nature-based activities in our books that I would love to see us do that. And so there's also going to be like um, tags. So if your specific interest is regarding artistic connection to ancestors or gifts and, and embellishing your gifts, that kind of thing, like, like Kate talked about drawing on their strengths, then some will be tagged for that. And some will be tagged for, you know, really great for children. And some will be tagged for really great for adoptees or people who don't know where they come from. So there'll be tags in there. So you can be like, oh, I want to really catch up on this stuff um, and kind of follow this stuff specifically. So it's, it's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So I just tried that link and it doesn't work. So if you um, want to try again. <laughs> I mean, for the um, summit, for the, I think for the summit, good. yes, I just copied it and pasted it, and it did not um, uh, did not open up. So I want to make sure that everybody's got um, the right link to be able right to. Link. Yes, 
I put in a capital I, but that's scary. Yeah, and there must be a space after com or something. I think I got a space in before or after you got it. <laughs> And I just want to make sure everybody can at least have the option. You know, one of the things that's so beautiful about these activities and um, and all of these books is, you know, book two might resonate with you and the journal for three and four might resonate with you. And they're all available and they're all very reasonable too. you know, the, the Kindle is what, $4.99 now. So it's it's a very yeah. it. it very reasonable to be able to get all of this rich information. You know, 25 um, authors in each book, except for one's got 26, if I remember correctly. Right. Yes. Go. A bonus one. Well, you know, about... I... no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say the, the new journal is, um, the new journal is a dollar ninety nine, and I'm going to leave it there until after the summit. I'm going to leave it at the dollar ninety nine price, and I believe book four is still at a dollar ninety nine until the end of October, and then it'll probably go to four ninety nine with the others on Amazon Kindle, as you said. Um, yeah. And so, let's try our new link and see if that goes. Tuck tuck goes. Yeah. It's like it's it's like it's Not going. Going. Yeah. I think this one should get us there. Oh, I didn't have the www. That's where the ah. that's where the that's okay. where the breakdown was. All right. Well, good. So that everybody's got that. And um the app Duco Duco, is that the app? Yeah, that was no, that's what Red Clover was saying was that is it um is the app is it up? No, we don't have the app for the eye reading up yet. It'll be up next year. I got I got diverted this year as Carolyn. As Carolyn realizes, we were both working on apps that got kind of sidestepped for for um, writing books for this year. But next year, they'll come back. Next yes, year we'll well, I, back. I know. I was actually starting to play with mine today. So um, going in and I know, if, getting started. And if you're in the today. summit. What's that? No, it's okay. If you're in the summit, if you're in the summit or the ancestors within community, then um both places will be talking about the app as it becomes live. It'll probably be February because it has to have 30 days to be approved by Apple or Google um, before they actually go live. So very exciting. Very exciting. And it's going to be called the Ancestors Within, right? So the app will the be app? the app. Or... I'm not sure yet. It's going to be Eurogenics. I'm not sure yet where I'm going to take it. Um I don't know yet. We'll we'll decide that a little later. I haven't quite pinned it down just yet. Okay. So all good stuff. But a lot of the ancestors within connections will be available in there because people will be looking at their eyes and working with their ancestors. So they'll be able to connect with a whole bunch of of um, ancestral tidbits and resources and freebies and tips kind of thing. That's really exciting. Yeah. So what else is going on? with you I mean you've got this app coming you're of course going to need a little bit of downtime after the books and the summit and everything but uh knowing you um it's not the app's not going to be enough there's something coming what is it <laughs> well so I'm, I'm I'm doing a wisdom workshop at Edgar Casey's um ARE Ooh. the Association Research and Enlightenment October 30th just before we go into the summit. So that's pretty exciting. And you can find it on the ARE website as well, or the ARE Facebook site. Um, but I'm going to be doing a class on seven ways to meet your ancestors today. And next year, we're going to be doing some activity books for ancestral connection okay. um, for children, again, for either adoptees or those who don't know their um, heritage, as well as um maybe those who are in like foster systems and foster care who are maybe struggling a bit with some of the things that they feel are happening to them and how to kind of take another look at them. That was always a great part of when I was working with Department of Corrections and um, yeah, kind of an exciting aspect. Um, yeah. So let's see what else is going on in my world. So next year will be the app the activity guides. And then my husband and I are going to return to, um, we started a book series like three years ago that kind of got left off while we were doing the Ancestors books, the Maddie Claire Owen series. And so I write the, 
the um, nonfiction and he writes the fiction in these books and they're spiritual mysteries. And, um, and so we're going to pop back into those next year. So so I love that you and your husband write together. That's so beautiful. (laughs) It really was a great experience. We were at that time, we were building on my experiences going in and out of Guatemala, (laughs) going in and out of Guatemala, working with Mayan priests and priestesses and, Um, so I had all the true aspects, all the actual things that really happened while I was down there. And then he built in this whole fiction story behind it, reaching back to the ancestors and the, and the ancient locations. And, and it's interesting because the book is really built around, um, do I even have it here? here. The book was built around, um, Chichen Itza and, at the time, I took a like 13 page downloaded message from Melchizedek. That was a true story. It was a true right. part of it. And in that, he talked about uh, a pyramid inside the pyramid, a temple inside the temple. Um, and then they found it like a couple of years later after I wrote the book. They found that inside tomb, that inside room that we had written about in the book that Melchizedek had talked about. So, um, so it's exciting to go back to the to go back to the series. And then, like you said, just having the app out there and then the activity books for the ancestors within so we're looking at a um we're going to do an ancestral cookbook cooking with the ancestors and it won't just be um foods of old it will also be like activities you can do with your ancestors so that's another thing on on plate for 23 so lots of exciting things coming up there are lots of exciting things coming up that's wonderful (laughs) that's great when I think Bonnie made a a good point. She was talking about how she was challenged by rejection by siblings and, um, and, you know, that she was trying so hard to be accepted and finally she gave up on it. And, you know, when I first got into ancestral eye reading, I was at a, a holistic fair and I was explaining to this retired admiral about what ancestral eye reading was. And I said, you know, one of the things that shows up in the eyes is the in utero experience, the experience of mom and dad's pregnancy with us. So in it, you'll see like, like when they first were talking about it, whether that was at three weeks or whether it was like the next morning. And I said, you know, I see this in military babies all the time when they were conceived just before active duty. And there was like that next morning I thought you were using birth control, right? That next morning conversation or even argument about we can't be having a baby right now, blah, 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 blah. And that nobody did anything wrong, but it can imprint on the child a feeling of not being wanted. And they just can't hear I love you. And this is where some families really get into trouble. And it's just a matter of having that conversation of saying, oh my gosh, you're right. When we first got pregnant with you, we were like, oh no, 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 not right now. (laughs) But then when we first felt you kick, when you first came out and we held you, we were so in love. But the child grows up with their intuition screaming, I wasn't wanted. And they can't reconcile it, right? Somebody's lying, either their intuition's lying or their parents are lying because the story hasn't been told. Well, this man was a retired Navy Admiral and a tear was running down his face. And he said, Amy, you have to keep doing this work. He said, we went to therapy with our son for years, seven, eight years. We went to therapy with our son for years and this conversation never came up and our son took his life. And he says, I know if we had had this conversation, it would have been fixed. This would have been the end of it. He would have, he said, I, I, as soon as I heard you say it, I knew that was the missing piece that whole time. He said, you've got to keep doing this work. And so yes, awareness is a big, big part of it. And just being able to stop and reevaluate things, especially you never listen to me. I'm a victim of you not listening to me. What if we could just reevaluate that and go, oh, that's right. (laughs) We haven't quite healed this one yet. So you're not listening to me just to see if this is going to push my buttons or not. And it does. So it's not healed yet. I mean, me and my GPS, I'm going to tell you, I know I have an ancestor where somebody was telling them directions faster than they could decide for themselves if it was the right thing or not. I can tell you, me and my GPS still have a very big ancestral moment and we'll keep working on it. Get there. We'll get there. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. That's uh, that's just incredible. 
So fascinating. Is so is there anything else that you want to leave? Oh, thank you. Is there anything else you want to leave people with? Like a, a question, a thought, something that they can do for themselves uh, to really understand or a process maybe? What, what's one of your favorite tools from all those fabulous books? Yeah, hard to pick. Well, <laughs> you know, my final statement is always, your ancestors have waited your whole life for this moment, for you to realize that every time you've had a tough time, they've been behind you going, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean for that to land with you. And every time you have a great moment that they're back there going, yes, 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 yes. So um, of course I love dream journaling. I love channeled writing, but really my favorite is sensory experience. So the more you can turn on things that your ancestors would have been experiencing. So for you, Carolyn, it's planting plants and, and snipping little ones to start. You and my husband, that man can steal plants. He says it's not stealing, but he propagates. You go to a restaurant, no plant is safe. Some people steal glassware. He's out there clipping the plants and sticking them in his bag. I'm like, oh, honey, <laughs> we just love to propagate. <laughs> like, Got to propagate all plants. This one should be at our house. <laughs> so um, sensory experience. So if you know, well, we all know our ancestors experienced the full moon, the smell of a campfire, the sound of the wind, the sound of rain, the feeling of sun on their, on their face, maybe yeah. walking in a river. We know that all of us have ancestors that have experienced those things. So the more you can build a sensory experience with your ancestors. Now, if you know they crocheted, as you're crocheting, your hands are making the same movement they made. Now, if you can add to that the sound of the wind or the rain or the smell of a fire or a candle, that kind of thing, the more you can move into to sensory experiences that duplicate what they had, the more you can step into a place where all of a sudden you'll be getting images from their world. And the biggest thing I can say is grab a journal, grab a notebook and wow. document any of these little quirky things that you think, is that my ancestor? Did I get that healing ability from them? Or today I ran into this person and I just can't explain it. It feels like this, this, and this log it because one day, 20 years from now, you'd be like, that's what it was. They were actually related. We have a common ancestor. Do you know, there was a girl who in sixth grade, she was a sixth grader when she did this science project. I'm going to say that. I think she was like 11 or 12. And her grandfather was a genealogist. And she did a science project where she did the genealogy on all of our, I think it was 45 presidents at that, 45, 44 presidents at that point. And every one of our presidents came from a common ancestor, King John in England, except for one, and the one was Buchanan. So both Clintons, Obama, all the presidents except for Buchanan had somewhere a genetic link to King John from England, which was King Richard's younger brother, the kind of shyster one. And um, so my first question was, well, then how about the person who lost, right? Like in every election, there's like really a, a Republican and a Democrat. There's like two people at the end. And I was like, were all of them related to King Philip in France, right? Or some Russian czar or what? We don't know who we come from. Every one of us had ancestors on this planet when the pyramids went up. Just because they're Norwegian does not mean they weren't in Jerusalem, right? There's so much to explore and everything you're looking for is who you really are and what you were born to become. So as much as you can start resolving these old patterns and reaching back and connecting with their lost intentions and their gifts and their abilities and start bringing those forward in your life, it's where you put your attention. On January 6th, I live an hour and a half from the White House. I could have totally got caught up in that. But I had a morning meditation that said, you're going to write some books. And in 700 days, we've written six books, right? Bestsellers across the board. So when we focus, where we focus, where we put our attention, whichever intention we plug into of our ancestors, that's where we can have our great strength and our great um, 
their great moment, right? These aren't my books. These are my 11 ancestors feeding it all in. And it's just a wealth of abundance and support. And so especially those who are going through tough times, wow, you're never by yourself. Your ancestors are back there backing you. And if you can't, if you've got like kind of creepy relatives a little bit closer, I mean, you got some ancestors that are hard to work with, hard to forgive. I mean, you know, somebody's related to Hitler, right? There's, 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 Mm -hmm. there's shared ancestors, you know, the more that we can go back and, and go to who they were as infants and two-year-olds and three-year-olds, if you can't quite get there with your ancestors and family right here, jump back, jump back to the first ones you don't know and just put a ton of love on them. You don't know who they were. You don't know who was here 1723. Whoever your ancestor was in 1723, put a ton of love on them. And all of a sudden you'll just see things start shifting and moving and, and changing. And people you don't even know you're related to will suddenly just start showing up with stuff. It's really a beautiful and amazing experience. And so your ancestors have waited your whole life for this moment. Mm-hmm. And you're next. What are you going to create? Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. Um, any final questions um, from people? for Amy before we sign off. Thank you for the copy and the applause. (laughs) Yes, that was wonderful. So uh, thank you so much, Amy, for being here. Oh, we got one new message. Let's see. Uh, Very interesting. Signed up for the course. Awesome. Yay. Yay, honey. <laughs> Good. Enjoy it. It's a free, wonderful experience. You know what I mean? It's just whether you plug into one podcast or a hundred or whatever, it's just, it's really pretty, it's really pretty neat. I know. And that's, what's beautiful. I love the fact that you're tagging, you know, common themes. So, you know, a hundred mm-hmm. can be a little overwhelming, <laughs> right? Thanks. So, uh, but <laughs> You know, if there's a subset that you really are interested in to help you understand your own ancestral lineage or challenge, then it's a great gift to be able to just go in and focus on that one area that, uh, you know, it might be tripping you up a little bit so you could open up your life. So thank you, Amy. Thank you. It's been such a joy to be here. And as you know, as we said in the beginning, I'm passionate about changing the way people experience their ancestors. I mean, it's just, um, there's a whole world out there. Like I said, I, like I said, and even, you know, Bonnie Joseph spoke to this. I spent years being angry, being suicidal at times, being depressed at times, because I want to know who I am. Who do I come from? What's wrong with me? All these things. When in fact, everything I needed was right here inside. If, if I just known that that, um, you know, that fountain of youth, that pool of the experiences of my ancestors and the gifts of my ancestors was inside me all this time. And I could have just trusted it and stepped into it. My life could have been so different. And my poor adopted family, their lives could have been different too. (laughs) Right. I I feel so bad for the things I put them through as a kid. Um, and it just could have been so much smoother for everyone for everyone, you know, the energy could have gone a whole different direction. But that was part of the process. It's part of the story now, right? Part of the story now. <laughs> part of the story now. It's yes, true. it is. It's- All right. Amy, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody who joined us live. Thank you to Bob and Noel for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about the ancestors and uh, all the, all the links are in the chat. So uh, get the books, sign up for the summit and join the community. Yeah. Yay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye for now.